Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending October 14th, 2017. First up, this was sent from my friend Brian. This is from Australia. Australian and American biological engineers have developed a stretchy surgical glue that rapidly heals wounds, a breakthrough that has the potential to save lives in emergency, its designers say. The injectable glue, METRO, capital M-E, capital T-R-O, is based on a naturally occurring protein called tropolastin. It is applied directly to the wound and then activated with UV light to form a complex seal. That's kind of like some of the stuff the uh, bonding agents, some of the dentists use too. They use a UV light to activate it. Its elasticity means it's designed to work well on shape-changing internal organs like the lungs and the heart. Yeah, if you do have moving tissue, it's good to have something that is uh, kind of stretchy. So uh, one of the professors that developed it, Professor Wise, likens the glue to that of silicone sealants used around bathroom and kitchen tiles. When you watch Mitra, you can see it acting like a liquid, filling the gaps and conforming to the shape of the wound. They think this could be used to save all kinds of lives in the future. As usual, too, as I'm reading these articles, all of the links will be posted down below in the description box. And next up, this is one is from my friend Tom. This is... Let me scroll up here. For some reason, my browser is being sluggish today. Mars spacecraft finds evidence of a gigantic Martian lake. A lot of people are going to say, yeah, big whoop. We know there were lakes on Mars. But the important thing about this article is to find the right kind of a lake and to find the biggest lake, or actually what you would probably call it more is like a miniature ocean. If you could find something like that on Mars and for sure know that a, the largest area possible uh, had, the, uh, had been covered with water and had the best chance of life, that would be, at least to my way of thinking, where you would want to land some of your probes that are capable of actually scooping up samples or even preferably drilling down a couple of feet and actually getting some really nice deeper samples where if there are any chances of uh, tiny, even tiny simple organism type of fossils, you would have the best chance of finding it there. So. Um, let me read just a little bit of the article. Observations by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter revealed that buried underneath the Iridian Basin lay massive deposits of minerals. That's what they found. The Iridian Basin is uh, the area that they found that they think is one of the largest lakes that was on Mars. Further analysis of these mer minerals suggests that they were formed by volcanically heated underwater vents. Billions of years later, these volcanoes have gone extinct and the lake has dried up, but the mineral deposits remain. The site gives us a compelling story for a deep, long-lived sea and a deep, see hydrothermal environment, NASA's Paul Niles say. Now, uh, remember too, we always thought, uh, when I was younger in school, we always thought that you needed sunlight for life to exist, and we found out now that even heat from hydrothermal vents uh, provides the energy needed for living organisms, and you don't necessarily need sunshine whatsoever. So they're thinking if these lakes had hydrothermal vents underneath them, which likely they did, they may have that type of life like we see in our oceans too. And next up, this one would be from Bob. And this is, half the universe's missing manner has, has just been finally found. Uh, this one, I think, is a pretty much of a certainty, too, because uh, what it is is it's baryonic particles, which is just another name for ordinary particles rather than some mysterious dark matter. And what happened is this uh, team of scientists got together, and they took a lot of uh, plates of images, a certain type of imaging of uh, the area between galaxies to where they thought pretty much for sure uh, strands of filaments of matter exist, but they would be too spread out and too um, lacking in density to be able to really see directly. So what they did was they took plates and plates, you know, millions and literally, I think they did, they took like a million plates and stacked them together to kind of amplify the image. It's the same thing you would do by using long exposure to get more photons to hit a photographic plate. So a dim image that you couldn't see with uh, your eyes, you could see by just getting more photons to actually hit the plate. And by doing super long exposures and even taking exposures over several nights and adding them together, you get the light to kind of amplify itself. Well, this is what they did with these little tendrils between the galaxies. So, And uh, one interesting thing, too, is after they did discover that they could view these um, tendrils of baryonic matter, that they're six times denser than they originally thought. So um, that's where a lot of the new unaccounted for matter is coming from, too. And 
like I said too, I think a lot of the you know dark matter was end up going going to be ordinary particles rather than some mysterious new thing that we'd never heard of or never seen before. I mean, there's also some room for certain types of neutrons, uh, neutrinos, certain types of neutrinos and exotic particles like that to take up uh, a few of the percentage too. But um, like I said before, I think it's going to be just ordinary particles, and some of it still could be accounted for by just dark dust far away that there's no way we can possibly see. Um, directly, but we may have some indirect methods, like using this method, for example, to discover these tendrils of matter between the galaxies themselves. So. Last up, um, you guys, uh, it was really nice. You guys have been saying a lot of uh, great comments about my little mini farm of growing lettuce, so I'm going to post some pictures here of it. This is pictures of my lettuce farm six days after planting. I planted nine seeds originally and eight of the seeds, pardon the cat there, the cat's wanting to be in the picture too, so I'll let her come on board. Okay, so yeah, I've got uh, nine nine seeds planted, eight seeds sprouted, so I've got a really good uh, percentage of that, and basically I've got enough seeds probably to last me for ten years, they'll probably end up going bad just from age, I think they tend to last three or four years, but anyway, just showing just, just some pictures about how it's going, I think if it goes, if it keeps going well, which it has been going, I think in a matter of about three to four weeks is when you normally get your first harvest. So I'll keep giving you updates week by week and we'll see how it goes. Um, I hope I can harvest them at least three or four times, if not five or six, before the, the leaves start getting bitter and I have to start over again. And uh, then if it seems successful, I'll just probably keep up with it and just start staggering them too. I'll probably have maybe a three, three in the seedling stage, three in the middle stage, and then three in the ready to harvest stage and do it that way. But who knows? I'll probably be learning as I go along. So anyway, that's it for, for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.